What the Tech is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create a high-quality website or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use offer code WHATTHETECH8. Audible.com, the internet's leading provider of audiobooks, with more than 100,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature. For a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash Andrew. What the tech? Hey everybody, welcome to What The Tech, I'm Andrew Zarian, and today we have a very special guest in studio. Paul Therod is not here. Paul is traveling the world. I think he finally took a week off for the first time, and I think he said something like 10 years. He's never been off. But today we got a perfect substitution for him. Uh, Mary Jo Foley from CNET, from ZDNet, also on Windows Weekly. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I made the trek to Queens. Now, I'm here. Now, nobody comes to Queens. I did. Tell us about your trip. Was it was it a easy trip for you to make to Queens? It was really easy. I um, got on at Penn Station on the LIRR, and 29 minutes later, got off in Bayside, and there you were at the train station. It, it's not bad. It wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. Now, when people think Queens, they think like Queens Boulevard, mm-hmm. like coming to America. That was Queens. <laughs> That's what it took place. It right. took place in Queens. This is like the country. It is. There's trees. <laughs> the first thing MJ said, he goes, on the train, there were so many trees around me. Like, <laughs> I've never seen that many trees. I thought I was actually going the wrong way. I'm like, oh, God, did I get on the wrong train? <laughs> now, you're you're not originally from New York. No, I'm from Massachusetts. You're from Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. By Paul or away um, from Paul? I, I grew up in a town called Ashland, Massachusetts, which is like 30 minutes west of Boston. Okay, so not bad. No. So you're you're from the suburbs. I am. It's not you're not like a big city person. No. Like my high school graduating class was a hundred people. Oh my god. Yeah. A small town. My, mine probably had like a thousand. Yeah. Small I mean, town. my high school had four thousand and it's here. Oh wow. Like in, in wow. a couple blocks away from oh, this. Wow. So yeah. uh big difference. But I, yeah. I wanna I, we're gonna do something different today. Like I've always wanted to interview you. Okay. Because you've been covering technology for like thirty years. 30 years. So yep. that's a long span to cover it. And it's actually from like the infancy of, I guess, tech journalism. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk to you about how it's changed. What, what you say, of course, we're going to be talking about Microsoft and yeah. the Lumia. You brought the Lumia uh, 1020 with you also. Woo-hoo. So I want to talk to you about that, Yay. too. So we have a lot to talk about. I know the chat room it has a lot of questions, too. So if yep. you have any questions for MJ, send them over and uh, I'll try to get it in okay. on the show because... Uh, we really don't do these one-on-one interviews, and I think okay. it's really cool. I mean, we've hung out like a bunch of times, and we we've have. spoken, but it's always like we're loaded by the end of the time, so <laughs> whatever you told me an hour before is kind of out the window, and it's always in Penn Station. <laughs> in a bar, Who in a dr- dark alley. <laughs> like, I tell people all the time, like, there's this great place in, on, in Penn Station called Trax, yep. and it's like an oyster bar. It's really good, actually. And it's phenomenal, and it's it like, is. who's going to like the subway to eat? oysters i know but their oysters are great if you're ever in penn station it's phenomenal you should go there <laughs> so uh, let, let's start from the beginning how did okay. you get in, were you how did you get into covering technology i got into covering technology by accident completely by accident okay um so when i graduated college i had a degree in journalism and no specialty and so i put my resume out there and i got two job offers i got one at Condé nast traveler magazine okay and I got one at a new magazine that was starting up in Massachusetts called Electronic Business. Okay. And the, I mean, Condé Nast is a safe bet, too. I, yeah. <laughs> but the electronic business job paid $1,000 a year more, so I took it. Oh, wow. And, and so, this is 1983. Okay. So I, I told them, I don't know anything about technology, and they're like, you're, you're going to learn on the job. That's how I got into it. That's how. So you went in. I mean, not but 1983. It wasn't like this. Everybody has an iPhone. You know what I no, mean? Like it's no. a totally like even now the people that don't know technology yep. kind of know technology. It's true. But you went into it like nothing. Like nothing. There was. Did you take like typing classes in school? Yeah. Okay. So. I knew how to type. Um, and I was a fast typist. I actually, when I was learning journalism, I'm gonna really sound like wow, like we walked a million miles in the snow during the winter, but. I learned when I was in journalism school, I learned on a typewriter because there were no computers. Okay. 
So every when we had journalism classes, we'd sit there and type on manual typewriters. So I mean, still, yeah, you had some sort of <laughs> like I remember my father. I remember my dad. Like when I got a computer, I got a computer like 1989, yeah. 1990. My dad wanted to learn typing when he was younger, when he was yeah. in school, right? And his mother didn't want him to. He said that's what women do. It's a yeah. secretary's job. You're not going to mm-hmm. become a typer. You're not going to mm-hmm. become, I guess, a secretary or like right. a type typist, whatever. The position stenographer. stenographer. <laughs> so like it's a waste. And my yeah. father always said, like, you have to know this. Like it's something that's yeah. gonna change. You have to know it. And he was right. <laughs> yeah, he, he was definitely right, a hundred percent. Yep. Um, so you took the tech job. Took the tech job. Like, what were you covering then? And so my very first assignment, it was to cover components. So uh my my very first published article was about beryllium copper wire. I'm not kidding. <laughs> so you went in like head first. I did. Like they were like, "Okay, you're going to write about this thing that people use to build computers and it's beryllium copper wire." And they were showing me like what what was a transistor, what was a capacitor. I didn't know any of that, yeah. you know. And so after, I did that for like a year and then I went to my boss and I said, "You know what? I don't really like covering this capacitor stuff." <laughs> And he was like, what do you want to cover? And so I went to the library because there wasn't really the internet then. And I looked around at some other publications and I came back and I said, I want to write about software. Okay. And he's like, software? I'm like, yeah. And I said, and I have an idea. I'm going to write about this new startup company. It's They're kind of young. They're, they're called Microsoft. He's like, never heard of them. You're kidding me. No. And this is a... This is 1984. Yeah, but it's like a tech magazine, you right. know? Right, but they covered components and they covered mini computers and, and, you know, it was more of a hardware magazine than a software magazine at that point. So they told me, okay, try it. So I called up Microsoft. I just called them and I said, hi, uh, I want to do an article about you. I'm a journalist. And so they gave me Wagner Edstrom, who was their PR agency, even back then. Yeah, so they've been with them forever. They gave me Pam Edstrom. Yeah you know, of yeah. Wagner Edstrom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I told her what I wanted to do. And she said, okay, who do you want to interview? I'm like, uh, I don't know, Bill Gates. She said, okay. So they threw me to the wolves. They gave me Bill Gates. I mean, but that's a huge, <laughs> uh, like at that moment, you, you're, you call Microsoft, you get like, do you think it's a big deal? Or is this like this, ah, oh, this new company called Microsoft. And here's this guy named Bill, Bill Gates. I was so young and, bl- and green and dumb. I didn't know to be afraid. Yeah. So I just I mean, went listen, in there. That's a huge thing. Like I still like even now, like I'm doing the interview <laughs> with you. I still get nervous. Like as soon as I hit record, I'm always nervous. Yeah. So yeah. like for you to just go in and be like, I don't know who this <laughs> Bill guy is. Yeah. So I they flew me to Las Vegas and I interviewed Bill Gates on the floor of Comdex, you know, which used to be this gigantic trade show like CES, but like the precursor to CES. And so I had Bill Gates um, for like a 30 minute interview. That's phenomenal. It was. And how was he? He like, was awful. Really? Bad interview? Yeah, bad interview. Because, you know, he could tell I knew nothing. And I don't blame him. He was bored. He kept saying that was the stupidest question I ever heard. And Did he really? Yeah. Oh, he was a jerk. Uh, but he that was his that was his MO. He was a jerk. Before, this was way before he became the Bill Gates of today. Yeah. You know, charm school Bill Gates, right? So, you didn't yeah. go through those, like, uh, what, what do they call them? Like, when you become a celebrity, like, your PR group puts you into some, like, classes. Yeah. God. Yeah. Like the Jersey Charm school Shore. training. Yeah, it's almost like, Trump. like <laughs> yeah. they teach you like the five things to say in an interview yep. so you don't look like an idiot. Media training and yeah, all media that. Training, yeah, media training, yeah. yeah. No, he hadn't had any of that. And so I, I persisted. I interviewed him. I interviewed the board of Microsoft at the time. I interviewed a bunch of the top engineers. And I wrote a cover story on Bill Gates. And then it was such a big success for our magazine that my boss was like, all right, you can cover software, fine. And and that's how he got started in software. Yeah. But it wasn't fun, right? It, like at that point, like it still wasn't like the fun software. Yeah. I wrote a lot about like CAD CAM software and CRM software. And, you know, I, that was kind of like my training on the enterprise. But, but here's a fascinating thing to me. Like now, if you're a, you know, quote unquote journalist, you right. know, an Internet blogger. Right. You're writing about, you know, Instagram. Yeah. You're writing about uh, <laughs> right. Facebook, you know, the right. Facebook app on iOS. Right. You and you really don't need too much of a technical background to kind of talk about True. Instagram, you True. know. Yep. You're just regurgitating whatever the press release says, and you're saying like, "I like it, I don't like it." Yeah. Like you actually had to learn. I did. Yeah, I had to learn because I've never um, taken a computer science class or a programming class. So uh, over time, my specialty became operating systems, which was kind of crazy, and developer tools a little bit too. So 
it was very challenging because those are really technical topics. It wasn't like covering the new phone or the new gadget, which also can be a technical topic too, sure. right? But uh, it was like you had to go in there and learn. And I was really lucky. They, they, Microsoft and other companies gave me access to their big guys, like the people who wrote Windows and the people who wrote VMS. At the time, were people not getting access to them? Uh, at the time, people were, but I think... There weren't that many women doing it then. And I think they were, I was very young and I was a woman and they were kind of put off by that when they saw me. Well, I was going to, do you think that was an advantage early on for no, you? I no, I think it was, it was an, probably a little bit of a disadvantage. Because you were, you were a woman in technology yeah. and especially at that point, it right. was a boys club. It was, it was. Yeah. Although the, the part that kind of worked in my favor was they always thought, I think they kind of thought, oh, she doesn't know anything. We can pull this over on her. And I would try to always do my research and be, come in ready you know, ready for an interview. And so they would say a lot of stuff. I'd be like, yeah, you're saying that, but you know what? People out in the field are saying this and they'd yeah. be like, oh wait, she actually did some homework. So you're starting to cover the software and you're getting mm -hmm. more into it. Are you, are you starting to enjoy technology yeah. or is it still like, at what point did it go from a job that you have to kind of learn to like, wow, I really think yeah. this is actually cool stuff. Was it around like, I, I guess like, I guess Windows 95 really kind of changed everything. Yeah. Like, was it, it closer did. to that era yeah. of technology? It was. So um, I, I got moved around a lot in my job. Like um, I worked at the time for a big technology public publishing company, PC Week, you know, which was the old Zeph Davis. And they moved me to California. I covered the database market. I covered um, Taligent, which was one of Steve Jobs's ventures. I, yeah. So I did a lot of things in the operating system field. I covered OS2 versus Windows and all, all those early battles. So that was really fun then. And then I got moved to Seattle. Because they said, you know what? You're going to cover Microsoft. You, you should, should move to there. Seattle. I'd never been to Seattle in my life. So were you in New York at the time or you're still no. in Massachusetts? So I was in Massachusetts. They moved me to California. And then after one year in San Francisco, they said, how do you feel about moving to Seattle? I'm like, I've never been there. Okay, you're moving there. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that that was actually great because then you were like right in Microsoft's backyard, right? And you could you really access. go and talk to people. Although in the end, that kind of worked against me too because they felt like I was around too much and they didn't want me around. Nowadays, do you think you, it's an advantage to kind of be where they are? Or do you think every, you, just everything is, you yeah. know, I think it's, it's easy still, for everybody? It's still pretty cool to be where they are because um, you kind of run into people in parties, social circles, yeah. you know, on the bus. Like when I still go out to Seattle, I always run into people from Microsoft. And That's funny. They recognize me. They they talk to me on the bus. And then they're like, don't tell anyone I'm talking to you. You know, <laughs> uh, You know, I've heard a lot of, a lot of that around yeah. you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I'm around you, I hear that. Oh, that's too bad. I mean, I, I think I did, you know, when I lived out in Seattle, like one of the stories that has become like an urban legend about when I lived there, but it actually is true, is I did uh, at a t uh, for a couple of times, I'm not going to say how many, I, I used to, because I look a lot like somebody who could work at Microsoft, I used to get on their corporate shuttle on campus. <laughs> I'd ride around and like just kind of listen like hey is anybody going to say anything cool or interesting and then would they be like that's mj no they didn't recognize me at the time which was great and then microsoft found out i was doing it and they kind of put my picture up and said hey don't let her on the bus it's like, it's like a mugshot right in front yeah. of, the bus driver has like your photo and, like looking at it. yeah and then they locked it down and they said you have to show a blue badge and i didn't have a blue badge so i couldn't do that anymore so you you were but you're still writing for traditional print yeah. you know early on like yeah. how was the transition for you like let, let's go from print yeah. to I know that was online big. like how did that happen for you like do you think it like obviously now like yeah you're Mary Foley like from from ZDNet yeah. like I'm reading your articles you're on CNET you're mm -hmm. you're all over the place yeah. but how was it initially like did you anticipate the downfall of print at that point or was it like oh this is cool too it's online yeah I I kind of was watching what people I knew in technology were doing and most everybody I knew was reading online. So I I just felt like, wow, print, especially in technology, hasn't got a long lifespan ahead of it. What year did you kind of think about that? Um, I Well, I started a blog, uh, the very first blog that was at Ziff Davis called Microsoft Watch. I, I actually went to the company and I said, I want to do a blog. And they didn't even know what a blog was. This was in, um, what year was this? Like, uh, I'm trying to think what year, like around 2002. Uh, and, and I just said, I, I want to write this thing called a blog and I have this idea. I think it's going to be really big. And so I had to pitch it to them and they finally bit and I started this blog called Microsoft Watch and it became pretty popular. So then they were like, oh, wow, everybody should be blogging. Like, this is a big thing. Yeah. And, but now now it seems so obvious. But back then it was kind of risky to do it. No, absolutely. Yeah. So 
I, I was at, at that point in my career, I was kind of like, I, I'm not loving this anymore. I'm not really into the print thing now. And, and if they aren't going to let me do this, I'm going to get out of the tech field and do something different. Oh, so you were actually considering getting out. What would you have done if you didn't go into the tech field? I, um, I went to chef school. And I got my chef's degree because I was really pretty sure they weren't going to let me do the blog. And I was oh, thinking, why, while I you chef. were still yeah, doing Yeah, I this. was doing chef school at night and on the weekends. And uh, so I finished that and I gave them an ultimatum. I'm like, all right, I can go cut carrots for seven bucks an hour or you're going to let me do this blog. And, and they let they you let do, me the do the blog. The blog. That's fascinating. <laughs> I mean, could you like, what if they're like, go cut your carrots? I would have done it. You know, you know, next chapter, whatever. That's fascinating. <laughs> do, do you enjoy cooking? I love cooking. Do you do yeah. it like regularly or? Yeah, I cook a lot. See, I I'm just ordering Chinese uh, food. All. Really? I'm like I'm like a true New really? Yorker pizza and Chinese uh, food every night. No, I like to cook. Yeah. There's a great steakhouse around here too, Uncle Jack's. You got it. You got it in the city. So, um, this is fascinating. Like I'm I'm learning so much about you, and I a lot of I'm getting messages left now. Like I never knew that about MJ. I never knew <laughs> she was going to be you know a, a chef. Yeah. Um. So now you're writing this blog, and now how? Actually, let me let me actually ask you some of these questions that I'm. Okay. Being sent over because I'm going to forget it. I need some beer. Hold on. Oh, no, definitely. Listen, this is phenomenal <laughs> beer, too. Good. I'm glad you like bitter, it. Bitter American. I brought Andrew a couple cans because I, I was scared he was going to have cores here or a I don't drink cores. You Budweiser. Don't. I was scared. I keep it So I brought, pure... I brought some just in case. Well, I like to be a little trashy. <laughs> I, I live in Queens and I like my Budweiser. At so I'm glad it's... you like that. Yeah, bitter so... American from San Francisco. Phenomenal. There's a little... Uh, a little crazy little space monkey, monkey. space monkey on it. So nice. I'm going to... Mm. Glad you like it. Phenomenal. Um, <laughs> when Windows 95 came out, I mean, they say that is the moment that, you know, the PC mm-hmm. kind of became what it is. You yeah. know, the average person got a computer. Did you, and I've asked Paul this, and, and mm-hmm. he said he kind of knew that there was something happening, but um, I, I actually, I don't remember exactly what his response was, but he kind of felt it. When Windows 95 got announced and it was being released, like, did you think it was going to become like this rock star of computers, like people flooding the stores and fighting over copies of Windows 95? Yeah, I did. Because you saw it. Okay. people were, li- as crazy as this sounds to us now, people were lining up at midnight to get Windows 95 in stores all over the U.S. And they, I remember TV stations interviewing people and saying, wow, why are you here? And they're like, I don't know. There's a bunch of people in line. I don't even know what I'm in line for, but I'm going to get it. It was like that much excitement around tech at that point and And just knowing there was this new cool thing yeah. that everybody wanted it had to have been a fascinating time for for you to cover because it was so yeah. much it's new stuff you know yeah. this like even windows you know three one three, one like one. <laughs> people weren't researching like tips and tricks right. you know what no. i mean like if you're a writer for three one like you're writing it but you're not i i feel like it was it was a different type of it article was. you're writing and yeah. now 95 comes out and you're everybody's tweaking everybody yeah. wants to learn every yeah. i mean it really change the playing field it so did. for yeah. you as a writer like how did that change how you're writing did it did it change like who you're targeting with these articles because i would imagine yeah. it's more of the average person buying you know a, a computer magazine and right, reading right right uh, you know because my beats always kind of been enterprise i never really uh had to think as much about what does it mean to cover this for consumers uh, but it did change what we covered for business users because they were also trying to figure out Windows 95 and how that was going to come into their companies and how it was going to affect them. So I was writing a different kind of article, not so much like tips and tricks like Paul, but more like, hey, there's this new thing and you guys are going to learn it and here's what it's all about. So it's funny, like Windows 8 is like coming full circle, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah, absolutely. It's just like Windows 95. It's like, hey, IT department, you got a whole new thing to learn here. Here it is, you know. Yeah, so we got to get you to learn it. Yep. I actually want to ask you about the enterprise stuff and how you kind of, you know, divide it into enterprise rather mm-hmm. than consumer because yeah. a lot of your article, well, you know, I, I I was reading your article. I do a little of both. It's a little yeah. of both, but yeah. I guess for whatever reason, people target you as enterprise. You know, when yeah. people label mm-hmm. the articles you're writing, it's enterprise. It's not the latest and greatest application for Windows Phone. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I want to ask you how you got started in that. But of course, we have to take a little break and talk about okay. our advertiser. And that's Squarespace, the fast and easy way to create a high quality blog, website, portfolio, whatever your need is. Uh, you can do it easily with Squarespace. I'm a big fan of Squarespace. I know many of our viewers are a big fan of Squarespace. And we're going to be running a little contest here on the network about Squarespace that I'm going to tell you about in just a minute. But if you go to squarespace.com and use offer code what the tech eight, you get 10 percent off uh, your purchase when you purchase it. Uh, but here's the other cool thing. You get a free trial. You could try this thing out. So if it's not for you, uh, if you're not, you know, it's not working for you, no problem. You could just cancel it 
No credit card needed, nothing. And here's a cool thing about Squarespace. Uh, what, a couple of my buddies, they're photographers. A couple of my friends, they have online stores. There's something for everybody. You could build out your website on Squarespace. They give you templates. They make it very easy. It's click and drag everything. You don't have to know CSS. You don't have to know any of that stuff. Uh, they also ensure that your content is going to be crawled on Google, on Yahoo, on Bing, whatever search engine you're using. Uh, they make it super, super easy. So here is a cool little contest we're running here. Uh, I want our viewers, because I know a lot of our viewers have Squarespace. I want you guys to send me your Squarespace site. Make a Squarespace site, send it over, and we're going to highlight it on the show in a couple of weeks. We're going to show you know which site we thought was the best, or you know what we could do? We could actually leave it up to the audience to decide which Squarespace site is the best. And the winner, we're going to give you guys a little prize. I'm going to announce it next week on the show, but this is something that I think all of you guys will want. Uh, we're going to announce a contest next week on, on, on the show when Paul's here. I actually haven't even told Paul about this contest. He might want to make a Squarespace site just to enter into it. Uh, Squarespace.com is a website. You get a free trial, and if you decide to purchase, you could use offer code WHATTHETECH8 and get 10% off your entire purchase. I want to thank Squarespace for supporting What The Tech. And uh, uh, you're obviously not Paul Therott. <laughs> no, nope, um, I am not. <laughs> you know, Paul, you look different. I'll tell you. <laughs> Got glasses. I think that's, that's what it is. That's something else. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to you about how you got into covering enterprise. Mm -hmm. On Windows Weekly, you obviously bring the enterprise conversation. Uh, I hear Hadoop. I hear Azure all the time. Yeah. Uh, we are going to dedicate the entirety of the second half of the show to Hadoop. I don't know. If, I don't know if you guys are interested <laughs> or not, but how did you? <laughs> I, I would be so lost. You would. That, that's so when you lose me. You say, you say Hadoop, and it just everything it's just. Like out you just blank gone out. yeah uh how did you get into the enterprising was it kind of was it the access you were getting towards enterprise level products at that point like what made you take that turn uh well uh, you know at zdnet this uh our site is supposed to be uh an enterprise site it's supposed to be for business users and that's why i focus a lot of my content on the business side there uh, and, you know, e even though I do cover consumer, too, it's because with the whole bring your own device trend and things that uh, CIOs and CTOs need to know about the devices coming into their org, we, ca we kind of have to keep up with the consumer side. But the main mission of ZDNet and, you know, PC Week 2 before that was really to talk to the business user. It wasn't trying to be bite. It wasn't trying to be, you know, yeah. uh, a, a more consumer focused PC mag or any of those or even CNET now, you know, CNET's our sister brand at ZDNet, but their their consumer were enterprise. So, but when you you write an article, obviously for both of them, yeah. um, is there any kind of difference on how the editorial pieces have to be for each and every one? Like That's, for ZDNet, uh, do they have like a certain standard yeah, compared to CNET? Not not a strict standard, but you try to think, you know, the person who's reading this is probably more business focused, so they're going to care about things like you know directory management and. and uh, you know, on CNET, they won't even care about that at all, right? Or System Center, you know, something I write a lot about for ZDNet. On CNET, if I wrote about that, they'd be like, oh, Lord, what is that? <laughs> See, for me, actually, this is, a good, this is a good question, too. Someone just sent it over. Uh, they're saying that, you know, with, with websites like The Verge yeah. and, and, you know, uh, Engadget and all mm -hmm. these sites, like, it's almost like tabloid tech coverage. It's like fast, boom, boom. You're not getting a gigantic piece on it but cnet has been around forever yeah um and they were saying you know how the writing style on cnet is so different than what it is on all these sites like it i is. personally like when i'm doing show notes like i'll go to all the other yeah. ones yeah i'll go to verge i'll go to yeah. engadget but if i i'm like oh this is interesting the first thing i do is go to cnet to kind really? of fact check really interesting to, to kind of read yeah. in depth yeah. on what it is like yeah. especially with the windows stuff like mm -hmm. nine times out of ten there'll be a story and i'll be like I want to read more about this. I'll go to CNET and it's you, you know, yeah. it's your article. Right. Yeah. And I'll get more detail. So I think there's a difference also, like, yeah, even on, on that level with mm -hmm. the reading, mm -hmm. like, I don't want to say, you know, you know, I don't want to say there's the New York post, <laughs> no, but no, it, or the daily mail. Or the, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's kind of like fast, easy, quick yeah. stories. You know, um, the, a lot of us who are still doing tech journalism after all these years, and we've managed to survive and still be employed, which is awesome. Um, we kind of came up in the in the era where uh, you had to have independent sources verifying something, or you couldn't run an article. Like at, when I worked at PC Week, the rule was you have to have three independent sources okay. who don't know about each other, who are telling you the same that tip, can validate the story, who yeah. can validate it. 
If you told somebody these days who, who hasn't studied journalism or been in this field a long time about that, they'd be like, what? I can go out with like a half source. I don't need three, you know. Do, do you feel kind of weird? Like you actually have a journalism background. Right. <laughs> and a lot of people don't. Yep. And like, do you ever go to a website? Like, you see a story, you read it. You're like, ah, like, why? Like, they're just not following any rule. No, I, I don't. I don't criticize him for that because you know I. I think there is a place and time for. Because I know kind of Paul thing. gets upset at that. He yeah. gets really upset. You know w- what I try to do is if I see something on a blog uh, where I don't feel good about their sourcing, I'll go out and try to source it myself before I'll follow it and make yeah. sure like my sources know about it. And if I can't find them, I'll be way more reticent to write about it because I'll be like, I can't prove that. I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you the first time that something like weird has happened with me when it comes to coverage. Yeah. Like I. Like, like I quote stories all the time and mm-hmm. I always give credit because that's yeah. that's just like not because I went to journalism school. Right. It's like what I think you do. You put a little source on the, the right bottom thing. and that's it. Like you, yeah. you you give the source. Yeah. And even if I like I, I'll quote Paul, like I'll say like I got it from Win Super Set. Yeah. Like I'll give him credit. Paul and I a couple months ago, uh, I, I guess unintentionally leaked some Xbox information. And hundreds of websites picked it up. I mean, like every possible website in the world this. picked this thing yeah. up. <laughs> and Paul was a little, you know, annoyed by it. Yeah. But like it happened, like, you know. Yeah. But the if you're reading it, I want to say maybe 10% actually gave credit yeah. to where it came from. And the other ones just wrote the story as mm-hmm. if, you know, it was they something it. that they found. Yeah. Like that, that bothered me. Like not because I want the credit. Like I, I don't want any credit. Like it has nothing to do yeah. with me. But like. You're blatantly taking what this guy said yeah. and you're saying a source told us like mm-hmm. they're just making up a story. Yeah. And I, I it's just irresponsible. In my, yeah. You know, that's I agree. I, I The thing I like that I've been seeing more and more lately is um, I've seen I'm starting to see some websites shame other sites that do that. Like they'll publicly say you should credit Paul Thorat. He's the one who said that. Or, you know, like even smaller sites, like way smaller sites, when they break something and it's a huge deal for them, they don't get the credit. I, I'm seeing other people who are journalists and bloggers go to bat for them and say, hey, hey, you know, all things D, hey, so and so, you guys should credit this guy. He's the one with the story. And that's great. Have you ever contacted whoever, let's say someone took your story? I have. have you ever kind of like, hey, listen, this is my story. Yeah, Give me if a it's line. really an egregious, like you just ripped off my story and did nothing, I'll send them, a, I'll try sending them an email or a private note and say, hey, you know, that that was my story, by the way. And like, is it a positive response you get from like, Mostly. oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Or was Mostly. it like oh. some say too bad. Tough it's cookie. public domain now. Uh, but a lot of them will say, sorry, let me add a link. And yeah. they do. So that's great. That's so frustrating. It is. You know, it's it's part of the territory, sadly. Uh, I'm going down a list of some of these questions okay. here for you. And I have a bunch, too. Uh is Mary Jo all about Microsoft or do you use any other uh, company software or services that Microsoft just doesn't do well? Yeah. So I, you know, I don't have any obligation to use Microsoft stuff. In fact, I, I, um, when the iPad first came out, I bought an iPad and wrote about the iPad because I was like, Microsoft tablets are awful. Windows tablets are terrible at that time when first generation iPad came out. And so I'm like, I don't oh, have to use what was Microsoft. It, the HP slate. <laughs> yeah. Know, it was awful. Right. And, so I, I always just say, you know, if I like the Microsoft product, I probably will use it because I'm mostly a Microsoft centric user, uh, but I don't have any obligation to like if right now. In fact, I'm really I, I talked about this on Windows Weekly recently. I want to buy a new laptop. And sadly, when I look at all the specs of what's out there right now, the one that's best suited for me is a MacBook. And yeah, I don't want to buy that. I'm really. But I'm, why? Why won't you buy a MacBook? Because, I mean, I have one here. I don't want one because <laughs> I, I, I mostly don't want one because I don't want my fate tied up with what Apple decides to do and not to do. Yeah, I, I I'm going to wait till this fall and see if any really good Windows uh, Ultra books probably for me come out. And if there aren't any, I might go MacBook. I mean, the best PC agent seven in the chat room says the best PC right now is a retina MacBook Pro with Haswell. I know. I mean, it, it's crazy to think that I want something with Haswell. Probably. You I, know. I talk to Paul about this all the time, and yeah. I think the, the scatteredness of mm-hmm. the PC market yeah. uh, to some extent hurts them. Like, yeah, and you ask any like you ask somebody like, oh, name me a Mac laptop and they go, oh, the MacBook. OK, you know, that yep. MacBook Air, yep. MacBook Pro, it's not yep. like you tell someone like, what's the flagship HP laptop? 
They, I guarantee you, they cannot even name you one HP laptop. Like, they cannot give you the name I of know. it. Because the names are so crazy like, on half these names, But this right? is all of them. Like, you got <laughs> I Toshiba. I mean, satellite. Everybody knows Toshiba. The satellite. Right? Yeah, yeah, like, you don't really know right. it. And I think that's a big it is. problem. Because it there's is. no branding connected to, like, this is the one you should get. Like, yeah. You know what I have right now? My So I've had the same uh, PC for the past three years. It's, a, it's an Asus. The name of the PC is a UL30A. That's the name of it. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna remember that. Yeah, who is right? <laughs> it's like it's like a, the model of my microphone, the TLM 103. Exactly right. I know. So yeah, that is a definite problem. Um, uh, you know, I I am wishing and hoping Microsoft might do a Surface Book, but I haven't heard that they would. Do you, you think Microsoft would make their? I, I I would. I've always said in order for Microsoft to kind of control what's yeah. happening in Windows 8, because I think the problem with Windows 8, and this is my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I could be wrong, but. Whatever Windows 8 machine that I've used, that's sub a thousand dollars. So let's talk about you know entry five hundred dollars, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. Um. I, I felt that there are hardware issues, mm-hmm. and it's not necessarily the software that's bad. Right. I just think that the hardware hasn't caught up. And one of the main problems that I have with almost every Windows laptop that I've used in recent years mm-hmm. is the trackpad. Yeah. These things are, and Paul thinks I'm crazy for this. But I use the trackpad all the time. He doesn't use it. Yeah, I do too. And the trackpads on these devices are awful. They are. The reason why I use a Mac is because the trackpad works for me. Yeah. Well, luckily, you know, Microsoft knows that, right? And they they actually have this initiative called Precision Touchpad, yeah. right? Yeah, and that's why they had to right. kind of force it on the OEMs. Right. But they're still, still not done great. crappy. I, know. I mean, they're still not I good. Know. I hope with uh, Windows 8.1 that we're going to see some people actually implement that and, and have to use this have to kind of tie their machines in and their apps into this so that the, the touchpad gets better. Do, do you think that there's a, like they know that like Toshiba is not putting the best trackpads on these yeah. things. Like they have yeah. to know. Yeah. And that's why they did the surface. I still believe, right. It was like Microsoft this is how you finally was it. like, Hey, you want us to show you how to build a laptop? You want us to show you how to build a tablet? Here you go. I'm amazed that we haven't seen more surface products at least be announced, yeah. you know, like I we know. have the signature series laptops, but yeah, that that's really it's still HP putting it out and Microsoft saying like, hey, look, there's no bloatware on this thing. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. I, and we haven't even seen or heard about a Haswell based surface. Right. Like that supposedly is coming or the rumored eight, seven or eight inch surface. We haven't seen anything on that. I read your article today on CNET about uh, Windows RT. Yeah. And how it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Really. And. I, Meaning not go away. Not go away. Hopefully yeah. get better. Get better, but not. it's not, it's not, they're not saying yeah. like, oh yeah, Intel has these new chips. Goodbye, yeah. ARM. No. Um, and I kind of wanted to ask you a couple questions on this because yeah. I'm fascinated that this device came out mm-hmm. and, you know, I understand desktop still existed because it kind of had to yeah. at that point, but is there long-term goal to say, okay, you have this Windows RT, which we were discussing earlier. I think mm-hmm. it's an awful name. It should not be called RT because nobody knows Three. what that is. Yep. Uh, yeah, Windows RT. Eliminate desktop totally. Mm-hmm. This is what you get. It's this uh, tiled interface and that's all you're getting. It's very yep. similar to an iPad or whatever. Yep. And then you could get the Pro model, which yep. is Windows. Yep. Like Windows and then there's this. Yep. Is that something that we're going to see like in the near future? Or it, this is going to be a long-term evolution type thing for them where yep. they have to kind of Hold hands. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what I think? I, and this is just me kind of basing this on sources and guesses and a combination of things. But I, I do think where they're going to do away with the desktop is going to be on surf, on the uh, Windows RT first, right? They, they've said publicly, the desktop is not going away anytime soon. But they didn't say where it wouldn't go away, right? I think they're going to keep the desktop on Windows 8, Windows 8, 1, 2, 3, however many successors there are to that. And then on Windows RT or whatever they end up calling that, sure. they're going to take desktop away. And they're just, I think they're just waiting till they port Office to be Metro style apps, which isn't that far away either. Like we're going to see betas of that this year. Um, um, and I'm hope, I'm excited for that. Yeah, because- Word, Word, you know, Metro style Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and a new version of the OneNote app. And once that happens, I think they're going to be able to say, okay, you know what? We don't need the desktop on Windows RT. And I think it's going to disappear there, maybe in one more iteration of, of Windows RT. I, I don't think it'll be this year, but maybe following year following year or the year after. So you, do, you, do you actually think that they should put out a laptop also? Yeah, I do. You know, a Microsoft branded Surface yep. laptop. I would love screen. it if they did that. Uh, 
my wife's cousin bought a Toshiba, a higher end too, Toshiba yeah. touchscreen. I forgot the model. Yeah. It's Windows 8. Mm -hmm. And touching, I think she's paid like $1,000 yeah. for the thing. Total disaster. Oh, jeez. I mean, just really, really slug. The touchscreen on the screen is actually pretty good, but yeah. the trackpad is bad. It's sluggish. It's slow. Battery and life, thinking, probably Battery terrible. life is probably atrocious. And, yeah. you know, when people are buying this thing, they're not saying like, oh, you know, that Toshiba Elite series, blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, that's a piece of garbage. They're saying, no. oh, yeah, Windows sucks. Yep. I and it, it's the, the the worst PR for Microsoft at this point is the OEM. It is totally is like whoever the OEM is like it is ru it's ruining the OS because I don't I don't use Windows 8 right now because yeah. I'm I'm in I'm in an environment that I don't have to you right. know I'm using production machines yeah. and I'm using I don't all use this Windows stuff. 8 I use you I use, use Windows it. RT so why oh yeah well yeah but you're still in the environment I yeah. thought you were gonna say no but on my laptop I never moved it to Windows 8 because Windows 7 works great on my existing laptop. Don't need Windows 8. How? So 8.1 uh, Enterprise, uh, they were they did like a preview of yeah. it a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, how is Enterprise feeling towards it? Is it this, okay, you know, I could kind of understand this. Or is it, well, we're just going to go to 7 because we've been running XP for the last, you know, yeah, 8 exactly. years. I think um, a lot of enterprises are still just in the midst of migrating to Windows 7. So I don't think we're going to see Windows 8.1 suddenly be this, you know, panacea. And everyone's suddenly going to go, okay. Let's all go to Windows 8.1 now. But I think they did add in some things to 8.1 that business users really wanted. You know, like this boot straight to desktop is back. And the start button for a lot of people, that matters. Um, so I think those kind of things um, and a few other features that they added in are going to make enterprise users a little less leery of giving it a try. At least do some pilots now, right? Yeah. It's fascinating to me. Yeah. I mean, the whole evolution of, of that operating system, <laughs> it, it was like a punch in the face. You know how they changed <laughs> it, it over. And uh, I always say, you know, Paul had this mock up on his website. I don't I don't think I Paul saw made that. It, but years yeah. ago, years ago, they it, like a year and a half ago, he had this it's cool mock up of like, yep. this is what Windows 8 should be. Mm -hmm. And it looked great. I'm like, oh, my God, if they did this, people would be praising this thing and saying, oh, my yeah. God, this is so much prettier than Mac OS yeah. 10. And but yeah. they took a big risk with this. They did. You know, they're investing in the next 10 years yep. and the evolution of the PC. And yep. I don't know if this tablet mentality is going to be the future of, you know, a screen and a keyboard and a tower yep. next to me. I know. Yeah. You know, that that's the whole I thing. Know. I know. They keep talking about choice. You know, like whenever they talk about Windows, they say, you know, what's great about Windows is you can have an all in one. You can have a laptop. You can have a tablet. Right. And, and in theory, that is a great differentiator for them. But. It was almost like, even though that was their differentiator, they went out and they made an operating system that was just for tablets. And they yeah. stopped thinking about all-in-ones and they stopped thinking about laptops and, and PCs. So I think that's what really caught them. It was maybe they were just a bit or more than a bit too uh, bullish about everybody going to tablets. I mean, they may have a point, though. Yeah. Like, I... I yeah. But do you think the feature of this device is actually touching the screen? Like No, I, I, I think touch on a laptop. I, I know there are a lot of people who think it's great as yet another input mechanism. You know, they, you have your keyboard, you have your mouse, and you have touch. I know when and if I get a touch screen Windows 8 laptop, I am not going to touch the screen. Yeah, but do I, I'm curious on what percentage do. I, I know. Like, they, my wife's laptop has smudges all over the place. Yeah, so, yeah. like, I think for her, like... She touches that screen. Who knows why? I know. I guess, it. you know, for some things, you, you get really used to using touch. You know, if you're used to an iPad, if you're used to your phone, you just kind of go, oh, let me just resize that window. Boom. Right. Yeah. For me, I use a mouse almost always with hooked up to my laptop, even even when I'm on the road. And so for me, the idea of like putting my hand off my mouse and touching the screen. No, it doesn't work. No. No. I don't know. I, th I think it's crazy. It's for some, you know, some people say it's making them more productive. Um, some people say I will never touch my laptop. So it's it's hard to get. I think it's hard to get a feel right now for how how many people, if they had a touchscreen laptop with a Windows 8, would actually be touching the screen. Right now, in, in for you, what is the most exciting piece of uh, software or hardware that Microsoft is making? Hmm. Uh, can I say Hadoop? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no Hadoop. Okay, no Hadoop. Hadoop is out. Um, I am excited to see what happens next with the Surface. I I really like my Surface RT, unlike Paul. And I, but I, I, I admit it's sluggish, uh, but I love that it's light and portable. And I think the eight hour battery on it's pretty great. 
So I am curious to see what they do next with the Surface and if there's a new Qualcomm processor in there, if there's some kind of new, um, I don't know, like LTE support. Surface RT. Surface RT. Yeah. Yep. So I'm I'm excited about that device, even though I know I'm probably one of like a tiny number of people. Tiny bit of people. Yeah. I I mean, I've had some hands-on experience with it and I can't, like, I like it. Yeah. But it's still not, it's still missing the whole, I need to get this now. Yeah. I loved, I re- was really excited about it having a keyboard because I'm a heavy typist, right? And I, like, that was my biggest frustration with the iPad was, like, you have to go get an extra keyboard or you're typing on glass. And I'm like, oh, I just want a keyboard. And when the keyboard was the cover, I mean, maybe it's just the cover that I'm excited about as much as anything else, right? It's, it's that to me was, like, a great idea. Not, like, some amazing innovation, but it was, like, yeah, that's what I want. If, they were to change one thing right now. What would it be on that device for you? That would make it really great. That would make it like, th- oh, wow. Uh, I I would like to have a Surface with a keyboard that, and without the kickstand so that I could actually control the degree of how. Oh, so like a dock. Uh, yeah, like how to. open or closed it is. Because, you know, the kickstand's great when you're sitting on a table. When you're trying to use that on your lap, terrible. It's, it's a little Awful. more difficult. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I would like that. And I would love to have a real keyboard, maybe even a backlit keyboard um, or a keyboard with extra battery in it, which is supposedly coming to. Rob Greenlee in our uh, in our chat room posted a link to an article on The Verge where it says like the UI concept, like what people had. Yeah. Uh, if yep. I could figure out which camera it is. Nope, there you go. Yeah, there it is. Here it is. Yep. Um, oh, yeah. this was, was this done by a guy in, in one of their uh, forums? I think he just came up with this. I don't know. It, I mean, it's pretty. See, yeah. like, I, as a power user, I kind of like the clutter. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, I like the clutter. I like to put everything here. Yeah, you and like I, having windows. I like having windows, yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, to have windows now, I need to have a Mac, <laughs> which is insane if That's you think about that. That's insane. Although, you know, again, with Windows 8.1, at least they're giving us some degree of getting our windows back. Right. I think we need to start a campaign at this point with that, right? Get windows. our windows back. I want my windows back. <laughs> I, I want. I still have a lot of questions for you about okay. um, you as a journalist and you writing. And, and Have you written a book? Yes, I have written you have. a book. When? I wrote a book in 2008 called Microsoft 2.0, how Microsoft plans to stay relevant. I feel like I asked you a stupid era. question now. No. Like, that's a stupid question. No, it was, it was a long time ago, right? It was five years ago, right? And I wrote this book about uh, what Microsoft was going to be like once Bill Gates left his day-to-day responsibilities. Ah. So I tried to write about the future, which is really tricky in writing a book, a tech business book. <laughs> but actually, I gave it my best shot. And I actually, now I want to know what you got right and what you got wrong. Uh, but let's yeah. take a little break. Let's okay. talk about our sponsor. And that's Audible.com. Uh, I'm a big Audible fan. Paul loves Audible. Uh, a lot of our viewers love Audible. And if you go to audiblepodcast.com slash Andrew, you get your free audiobook. Now, I am not... My wife is is a much bigger Audible fan than me. And what she does, she actually uses all my credits. So I'm left with no credits. When I, let's say like I'm going to the beach or like we're going for a long drive. It's all of her books. So I have to pick something from her book that uh, that she picked. So let's see if I got, a, I got one here. I have um, The Outliers, The Story of Success. Jessica's a big fan of The Outliers. Uh, she... I, I think she read this book like a month ago and she was like, oh my God, this thing is amazing. This thing is amazing. You need to start reading it. So uh, I'm actually starting to read this now. I say read, even though it's an audible book. Like it's like, I'm starting to listen to it. Like you're reading it. Yeah. There's a story about Bill Gates in that book. I believe in outliers. I think so. I believe there is. Cause she told me something about that. Yeah. We won't spoil yeah. it. Uh, outliers is my pick. Uh, Paul normally goes in this huge, long thing about the book and, and what he liked. And people told me, keep World War II out of this week's <laughs> episode because Paul and I end up like we're like, oh, we got this really good show for you. And it'll be like a 45 minute rant yeah. about the Nazis entering Moscow. Like we end up going into World War II. So no World War II pick this week. My pick is The Outliers. Uh, go to audiblepodcast.com slash Andrew. Get your free audio book and uh, it supports us. It helps us out. And uh, that's my Audible pick of the week. Really quick pick. And then I want to get back to MJ. Uh, so before I ask you about the book, writing a book versus writing, you know, a blog yep. for CNET. Mm-hmm. How do you, how, like, is there a difference for you? Are you able to, like, is the style different for one compared to the other mm-hmm. one? How do you do it? Uh, so I should say writing that book 
and I, I had a year to write it. Uh, writing that book was one of the worst experiences of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Really? Yes. <laughs> Why? Uh, because I'm not a person who um, likes long form and likes projects hanging over my head. I That's why I really love blogging because you write a blog post, boom, done. On to the next blog post. And I just really hated every day. Like, well, plus, plus it was my day job was covering Microsoft and writing a blog. At night, I'd go home and have to write a book about Microsoft. And I, yeah. I was like dreaming about Microsoft. It was horrible. I was having these like bomber's uh, hand I just know. grabbing you. I wake up in a cold sweat. Like, oh, I, I gotta finish this book so I can stop thinking about Microsoft twenty four seven. So yeah, I, it's a different style. It's a different way of working. Um, it wasn't my cup of tea at all. Uh, no more books for me. No, you're never going to nope, do it again. Never again. Maybe about cooking. Yeah. So maybe How about, about beer. Would yeah, you write a beer I would, book? I would actually. I would write a book about beer or cooking um, or something totally outside of tech, but not about, definitely not about Microsoft and not about tech. So the book you wrote, yeah. uh, you kind of did this whole thing you said about life after, you know, Bill Gates. Yeah. I was going to say Steve Jobs because I'm so used to saying <laughs> know, that for right? like Apple yep. after Steve Jobs. <laughs> but what did you get right and what did you get wrong? Like, did you see? Yeah, it, it was really interesting because here's here's a little backstory about that book. So when I first was approached by Wiley to write that book, mm -hmm. uh, well, I was approached by Wiley and they said, what kind of a book would you write if you could write any book? And I said, I don't want to write a book. And they said, okay, if you could write a book, what would you write? And so I wrote this like off the cuff proposal about, I write about what Microsoft's going to be like after Bill Gates leaves. I mean, that, that's a fun topic. And I sent it to the guy who sent it to me and he said, sold. I, I'm writing a contract right now. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't want to write a book. And he said, you're writing this book. So uh, you'll do it. Yeah. yeah. So I went to Microsoft and I said to them, hey, I just got this contract to write this book. And they're like, awesome. We're going to give you access to everybody. We're going to give you Gates, Balmer, Ray Ozzy. We're going to give wow. you Jim Alchin and everybody. You're going to get everybody. And so I started writing the book and then I went to them. I'm like, OK, I got to, you know, but get why? This why were they so because they knew me, I think, and they knew I was going to be very try to do a very good job. OK, so. After about a month, they came back to me and said, you know what, we thought about this and we're not gonna talk to you at all. And so I guess you're not gonna write the book, huh? And I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna write the book. I already took the advance, I'm writing it. <laughs> the money's spent. <laughs> the money is spent. So they sent an email around, I heard, uh, telling everybody in executive positions at the company not to help me because I was writing a book. But why, why the change? I think because they decided they didn't want to make it look like it was going to be a big deal that Bill Gates was leaving. They wanted the story to be Bill Gates is leaving and it's business as usual and nothing's changing. And I was going to write a book saying everything's about to change and yeah. here's how it's going to change. Well, it kind of took them a while too to kind yeah. of leave. They didn't they didn't want that book. They that yeah. was like not the public story they wanted out. So I had to do this without them helping me and so I had a lot of sources inside and outside the company who helped me, gave me documents, gave me help talked to me off the record. And so I wrote a book based on people who I knew who were helping me out uh, about what I thought was going to happen. So I predicted like which executives are going to stay and leave. And were you were you right on? I there, was or? right on a few. Like I predicted Ray Ozzy was going to be out. And um, I remember when I wrote that, everyone's like, you're wrong. Ray Ozzy, you know, Bill Gates handpicked this guy to be the chief technology officer. He is in. And uh, it was funny because I had never met Ray Ozzy. They would never let me interview Ray Ozzy. And so after the book came out, I got to interview Ray Ozzy. And so it was very, it was a very funny interview because Ray said to me, I have like seven copies of your book. I'm like, wow, why? And he said, because you know how you wrote, I wasn't suited for Microsoft and I was going to be out. And, and I, I read it every night no, before he I said, go to bed. He said, all my friends were highlighting that and sending me books saying, did you see what she said about you? And, and then Ray Ozzy left. <laughs> was, what, was he? Oh, so when you interviewed him, it was after the fact that he left. No, it, it was before he left. Oh, before he left. And okay. I said, well, I hope I hope you weren't offended. And he said, I wasn't offended. He said, you actually got right about the challenges of somebody like me working at Microsoft. And then after that, he left. It has to be a very cutthroat environment. Very though. cutthroat. Yeah. You know, especially on the executive level. Yeah. We've seen such shifts exactly. over the last couple of years. Yep. Uh, it, oh God, it makes me sick thinking just to go in there, I you know, know. And work. Uh, what did you predict as far as because uh, to me after Bill Gates left yeah. Microsoft kind of became a little bit more innovative and became kind of more hip you know they yeah, they kind of changed that well you know I guess Xbox was part of it but like yeah. post, you know 360 is not mm -hmm. really Bill Gates right uh, Windows 8 is obviously not Bill no. Gates Windows right. Phone like all these 
the things that represent what Microsoft is now yep. is very different than the Excel spreadsheets of Windows True. 95, Windows 98. True. So I, I think like as far as image yeah. goes, I guess ba- I guess Bomber did a good job, you know, as far well, as keeping changing the image of the company. Yeah, you know, so many people who hate Balmer are like, oh, after Bill Gates left, it just went downhill. No more innovation, right? Like Bill Gates was the one who did like tablet PC and, you know, uh, information at your fingertips and all these things. And what people forget, I think, was the first few years that Balmer was the new head of Microsoft, what, he was kind of like having to deal with all the Bill things, right? All the projects Bill had set up and Bill initiatives. And so it wasn't really Balmer's Microsoft for the first, I'd say five plus years that he was running it. Yeah, He had to let all those things run its course and kind of get rid of people he didn't want around and let attrition happen. And now now I'd say very much uh, Microsoft is is Steve Ballmer's company. Oh, absolutely. And you, right. could, kind of, you could see that, you yeah. know, you look at Microsoft from 1999, mm-hmm. right? 2000. Yep. And you look at Microsoft now. Yep. Totally different. Totally different. I mean, yeah, they were. I mean, even down to the stupid Apple campaigns. You know, like yeah. oh, Macs are cooler than PCs. Yeah. Like that is not what it is now. Like right. that might have been true 15, 20 years ago, yeah. but like you look at it now and you say like, well, actually, and I'm a, by the way, I'm a Mac user. Yeah, Microsoft is doing far more innovative things mm. than Apple is as far as Windows, as far as the desktop goes. You know, the, right. Microsoft is breaking the traditional mode the, the traditional i guess glass ceiling mm-hmm. of what a operating system should be yep. and they're doing like these crazy tiles and pinch and zoom and all this stuff well os 10 is still you know what it is it's unix <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's a simple you know it's exactly yeah. what it's supposed to yeah. be yeah it's funny yeah a lot of times you know i think balmer kind of got pegged with and i wrote in my book about how he was you know, he's more like the MBA guy, right? He appointed a lot of people to head the divisions at the beginning who are suits, not engineers. And then after a series of years and a lot of criticism, they they kind of undid that and they brought people in who are engineers to run divisions like Office and Bing and, and uh, Windows Server and Windows. And I think that's when they kind of got their innovation mojo back. Andy goes in our chat and brings up something interesting. Uh, he says, ask MJ if Microsoft needs to do another Mojave project type Windows <laughs> campaign. I know. Do you know what that is? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I thought it was brilliant. I thought that was one of their best campaigns. And yeah. so they they brought a bunch of people in a focus group and they didn't tell them that they were looking at Vista, right? Was it Vista? I think it was it was Vista, but like towards the end. Yeah. And they and they showed them this operating system and they showed them how it worked. And then they and they said, what do you think? And they're like, wow, that is amazing, right? They didn't know it was Vista and they weren't all tarnished by all the negative publicity Vista was getting. So when Microsoft did this, everybody was up in arms out in the trade press. They were like, what? They tricked people. Like that shows how desperate they are. Right. But I actually thought it was good because I I felt like, yeah, you see, like what makes people influenced? It's not actually the product. Right. It's all the talk about the product. I I think also, you know, you went from 95, 98 to XP and people kind of got used to like, okay, this is what it is. It's yep. going to, and I could, if I want to buy, like, I don't think people that went and bought a mid range to high range PC yeah. were complaining about Vista. Like yep. I, I guess, I guess the initial, like before SP one, yeah. it was, it was kind of clunky it was. And, and the UAC prompts. Yeah. So that was problematic. Also 64 bit. Like yeah. they had a lot of issues, but I still think like Vista was better than XP. Right. Like, yeah. like let's not forget that. Like XP was good and was solid, but right. It was still, you yeah. looked at XP, like I look at XP now and I'm yeah. like, wow, this is dated. <laughs> and I felt that with Vista, yeah. like when Vista was out. Yeah. I think there were a lot of a lot of that going on. Yeah. But also a lot of people got used to saying like, oh, Windows Vista sucks. Like yeah. I'm not going to use Vista. Yeah. Yeah. And that went a long way. And I think that's also the problem that they're facing again. They like, are. They are. It's not, I, I again, I'm not going to, I'm not saying it's Vista. No. Because it's nothing like Vista. No. Like the, the. The PR backlash that Microsoft had at that point no, that when was, it came with, you know, came from uh, the magazines yeah. and it came from the newspapers, like totally different than yeah. it is now. It's true. But it kind of feels the same. It does. It feels a lot the same. And, you know, uh, I just saw Tom Warren was tweeting this uh, over the past couple of days from The Verge. He was like, I just had to show my mom how to use Windows 8 and now she loves it. And that's the problem. It's it's. People need somebody to show them, I think. Yeah, you can figure it out. You know, power users definitely can figure it out. But when my mom saw Windows 8 on my Surface, she said, do not put that on my machine. My mom's 76, 77 years old. She's like, that is way more complicated than Windows 7. 
She thinks Windows 8's more complicated than Windows 7. Why? Because it looks so different, yeah. right? And people just hate change. And I think I think it's so much more. It's not so th so much that it's difficult. It's just that it's so different. You know, my father's not a big. Uh, actually, he's not a computer user at all. Yeah. He has an iPhone, yeah. and he totally understands this thing. Like he gets it, and he yeah. does email on his thing. Mm -hmm. I give him a Windows laptop, and it's like. Phew. That's me with a Mac. I've tried it's to use a bad. Mac. It's. I'm, I forced myself. You know how I ended up using uh, a Mac? I broke my my laptop. Yeah. And uh, I got a Mac from my my wife's. When we got married, my wife and I, uh, I bought her a MacBook. She yeah. wanted a MacBook. I got her a MacBook. Mm -hmm. She never touched the thing. Wow. Like she she's like, I don't like this at all. Wow. Uh, give me give me a Windows laptop. So I got her a Windows laptop. My laptop broke. I kind of got stuck with the Mac. Mm -hmm. And you know, I like it. I like it better than Windows. Yeah. Uh, not Windows Seven. Right. Windows 8. Yeah. So for me, like I've been using a Mac for a couple of years now and I became, <laughs> I started using it full time. Yeah. Like over the last two years. Yeah. I'm not crazy about Windows 8. Yeah. I'm not saying it's awful. I yeah. just, for me, I don't, if I, I guess maybe if I was forced to use it mm -hmm. like every day, like I yeah. was with the Mac, yeah. I'd be like, okay, I get this thing is pretty cool. But yeah. like just at a glance, I can't get myself to do it. Yeah. And that's how I am with the Mac, which is funny. You know, I But see, I felt the same for the Mac yeah. too. I did not like uh, OS 10. I didn't want to yeah. use OS 10 and I got forced to use it and I like some of the stuff that they yeah. do. Yeah. I just it's funny because so many people are like, "Wow, you must really hate Apple because the Mac is so much more intuitive and easier to use than Windows." I don't it think It depends so. what you're used to, right? Like I am very used to Windows. So when I see the Mac, everything I want to do is reversed pretty much, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I I'm, I'm always having to go, "Okay, do I open a window this way or this way?" And it sounds like a trivial thing, but you get in habits. Well, right? the fact that the fact that when you hit X on a program doesn't close the program it docks the program yeah, and then like, you're like wait what <laughs> i still think that's the dumbest thing in the world like yeah. why would i hit x to to kind of make the i know. still allow it to run exactly like, if i want to do that i'll just you know minimize it right. i don't want to right so weird I know. it's so weird but that said i still prefer windows 7 to windows 8 i i don't oh, sure you know because i right now i'm very used to how my work habits are on windows 7 and i'm gonna if, when I do buy the laptop in the fall, if I can find one I like, I'm going to put Windows 8 on it uh, just because it will be 8.1 at, by that point. Just because I'll be like, all right, let me try to get used to this. And if I really hate it, I'll go back to 7. Also, another problem that Microsoft has, and just talking about this made me think of this. Like For years, we've had the speed race for CPUs. Right. CPUs, GPUs, yeah. RAM. Like, oh, mm -hmm. this has this much RAM, that has mm -hmm. that much RAM. Like now, and that was actually part of the reason why you bought computers. Right. Like. You would you would wait. The operating system would come out. You would mm -hmm. get a fast, you know, whatever's the top end at that point, and you would use that for two, three years, right. and then the same thing would happen. You would get another one when Microsoft released it. Now, like that race is not there. Like you ask someone, like, yeah. what's the fastest computer? Like before, you could count the megahertz. Right. Now it's people have no concept of that, no. and I don't even think it matters. Like specs don't matter anymore. Yeah, when you're Only buying to a laptop. power users, right? I mean, Only, I guess, but like I know so many people going and buying laptops yep. they don't even understand what cpus no. in there like and i think a lot yep. of time people went and bought whatever you yep. know they bought the highest whatever the highest one was yep. like oh this one is 200 megahertz like yep. i'm gonna buy that yep exactly that's out the window so microsoft doesn't have that anymore yeah to kind of like help them right. sell i know right so that's why you have things like touch right you have touch you have retina you have right yeah you all know. these new technologies because people want to feel like they're getting something new Right. Like, I want something better, something new. And like, I, I think you're very right about the whole s speeds and feeds thing. But if you show somebody a laptop with a touch screen and you're like, hey, look at what you can do there. Oh, huh. like SSD drives. Uh, the greatest thing I ever changed on any of my computers yep. was put an SSD in that thing. Yep. I mean, night and day. Yep. I mean, it, it makes such a significant difference. But p computers aren't coming with SSDs. Still. Right. Like, it's not like I know. Yep. You got a, you got a 4X SSD and now you got an 8X yep. SSD. You know, that doesn't exist. <laughs> I like, know. It's an SSD. Nobody yeah. knows anything yeah. else. I know. It's, so it's interesting. So uh, you got the Lumia uh, 1020. I do right here. Um, I want to I want to ask you a couple questions about this. Like, who's going to buy this? Like, uh, <laughs> Paul loves it. I know. Because he loves Paul, it. He's a photographer. He's a, yeah. He wants to take pictures. Like, I, I would get it because I want to take pictures. But yep. who's like, it's such a niche. It is. Product. I think it is too. Although I'll say, so I'm I'm somebody who 
I, I was joking with you earlier about this. Like if you go on my uh, photo stream on my Lumia, it's all beer pictures. <laughs> Should I show you? Yeah, mine, mine is alcohol too. It's so. like oh, my camera roll. Like, look at this. <laughs> Can you see how many beer pictures are oh, on it, there? It's a, uh, all I'm looking at is beer and like the subway. Yeah, the subway. I took some subway pictures too. Do you but, like, like trains? Look at all this. Look at all these beer pictures. Oh, that is really funny. Okay, so for me, even though I got to say Nokia did a great job making this pretty easy to use. Like I, I was joking on Windows Weekly and I said, so easy even I can take pictures with it like at, at high resolution, right? They have the Nokia Pro Cam app that has all these settings and, and you can set them and see the effects while you're kind of toying around with it. You just have to point, shoot, and then you can crop. It's really, really easy. So they, I think they don't, they don't see this as a niche product. They don't. They do not. They see this as a phone anybody and everybody would love. Okay. I, I think for me and for many people, that might be too much camera. Right. Wait, too, okay. Like I have also my 8X, my HTC 8X, which is my regular phone. And which I like that phone a me lot. Me too. I love this phone too. And I, the camera on this is not spectacular. It's good enough for what I do with a camera. So I think that's what they're up against is good enough. Compared to the 920, like you take a yeah. 920 and you take, you know, the 1020 right. and you put them side by side. What do you think someone's going to pick? I think it depends on your carrier, your contract, the price, right? Like this is a pretty expensive phone. It's $300 yeah, it's not cheap, to yeah. your contract on AT&T only in the US. That's, that's okay. That's a lot of variables you have to sure. be willing to go with to get that phone. I, I think I think um, the 920 is definitely good enough for a lot of people. On Verizon, the new 928, de definitely good enough for people, you know? So yeah. I, I, I think... The camera is a cool selling point. You, you're very dependent as Nokia and Microsoft are on what people show customers in the store, right? You're going to find a guy who really knows about the camera and loves it, who's showing you this phone at AT&T and saying, you know, what? well, here's the yeah, difference, yeah, yeah. right? And if you don't have that, would you even care or no? I, it's, it's a, it's it's a, a big tough bat. sell. Yeah, it is a tough sell, yeah. but I think for someone that like our audience, they're they're right. the ones that are going to buy this thing. Yeah, I mean they're going to go they out are. there and be like, oh, the ten twenties out there. Yeah, we're going to buy. It, it takes amazing pictures. I mean, like when I took a picture of a of a beer glass, you know, something I know well, <laughs> you could see every little dot of sweat down the side of this thing. I mean, it, it's like incredible. Yeah, I saw so when we um when we went out. Yeah, somebody there had it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and, uh, one of the Windows Phone guys. Yeah, yeah. and um, I was told I can't say who it is. You can't. Yeah, okay. Um, when we went out with some mystery person some mystery guy on the that Windows happened to have Phone this. team. <laughs> uh, and he took a couple of pictures with it, and the, the amazing thing was, like, the zoom-in feature. I know. Like, holy crap, like, he zoomed in, and on the it reset, amazing. it's amazing. It is. Like, you could take, I could take a picture from here all the way across your living room and pick up details on that painting over there, right? Yeah. And when I zoom in, I could see everything. I mean... I don't have to go up close to it to take the picture. But what do they right? do with the next phone that they release? You know, know what I mean? Like, do they keep doing this? Or is this like a one shot? Like they'll release like this phone every year and they'll have right. like the high end one. And then different carriers get different. Yeah. Variants. Like, I don't know how. I know. Because now like you've set the bar so you high. Have. You have. I know. It's maybe tricky. they'll go to like 20 megapixel. You know, Yeah, maybe maybe something in between. You know, where where Nokia is doing really well right now is the low end of the market. Right. Like they're not doing as well, especially in the U.S. at the high end of the market. But in the low end of the market, they're selling a lot of phones, especially in uh, developing countries. And it's more like what they're doing with the low end phones that matters than what Nokia's they're doing always done that because they right. have brand recognition exactly. in that market. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, there are 10 countries and they're not small countries, places like Russia and India, where where their market share is really big. And it's just here in the U.S. we have this view, you know, oh, we were the three percent or the four percent. And so I also think Nokia could not penetrate the U.S. market prior to the smartphone, yeah. you know, boom, like right. they've never been able to kind of come in here. Yeah. Like, I remember we had those Nokia, like those yeah. brick ones that yeah. were like this shape mm -hmm. and everybody used to play snake on them. <laughs> but yeah. it was on AT&T only. Right. You couldn't get on anything else. Exactly. And it was always like, this is going to say, like, this is such a New York thing. Like, the Greek kids always had it, like in school, because <laughs> wow. they used to go to Greece. <laughs> no, but the, the, and I know and, what you mean. Like, the, like the kids, like they the Italian kids, because they used right? to go to Greece, like yeah. for the summer, they used to go visit their families. Yeah. And they used to get like a throwaway phone. And yeah. it was a Nokia. Right. So they used to come back and they then they ended it. up buying Nokia. Like that's who I remember had these mm -hmm. phones. Mm -hmm. So for Nokia in the US market, like people don't battle. even know, like know. it's actually Nokia, right? Yeah. It's not even Nokia. I know. I say it wrong. I know. 
I watched <laughs> I watched that commercial that video for the 1020 yeah. that they had, and I'm like Nokia. Yeah, that's an O. It's not an A. <laughs> so if you were to then we'll wrap it up to okay. this. Like so, what what are you buying right now? Like product? You said you need a laptop. I need a laptop, and you're considering a MacBook Pro. I I am not wanting to consider that. I'm waiting till this fall because uh, supposedly there are going to be some really great Haswell Ultrabooks in the market. And if they have the kind of battery that a MacBook Pro has, it doesn't have to be exactly that great. But if, if they're in the 12-hour range, I'd be very interested. I want you to buy a MacBook Pro. I don't want Just to Just like a watch head, Paul's head explode. I just don't want one. Um, I don't know. I would rather not have one. Get in, get in and put Windows on it. Yeah, that's what I would do, obviously. I wouldn't run Mac yeah. OS. But uh, that's like my last resort, kind of. Uh, I The other the Ultrabook I've been kind of eyeing is the new Samsung Ative Plus 9, whatever it's called. Because I suppose they're going to have a Haswell version of that. And that is a really amazing looking machine. But I, I need it to have more than five hours of battery life, which is what it has right now. People are giving you suggestions on what you should get. Someone says uh, Sony Via Pro 13. I know a lot of people like the Sony Via. I, I, my stepdaughter had one and um, she didn't love it. Really? But it, that was a number of years ago, too. So um, I always thought the Sony Vios were like the higher end, you know, the Mac yeah. PC product. Like I yeah. think, I think Sony Vios have always looked nice. They look really nice. They've always been pretty, just yeah. crazy over. You know, they're yeah. very expensive. Her battery life wasn't that hot, and I don't think her trackpad was that great. Well, but you know what? This is actually cheaper than the um, the MacBook Retina. The Ative. So the the Vio. Oh, the Vio. Uh, Pro mm-hmm. 13 inch Ultrabook, for, uh, Haswell processor, mm-hmm. uh, HD IPS touch screen. What's the battery on it? 512 SSD. Uh, 2.34 pounds. It's uh, 1249. Yeah. I don't see a battery. I know. Uh, the, the battery actually, life thing is specs. what's worrying me on these. I mean, Haswell, obviously, it has much better. It's going to be better than what you. Right. Yeah. Much better ratio of power and battery. But That's funny. Nothing about battery life. I know. Uh, and you know what? Ah, we, here we go. All day mobility. Yeah. Whatever that means. Right. I know. Worrisome. Watch a YouTube video and watch that battery drain. I know. I, I need. My my biggest criteria because of what I do is I need a really good keyboard. I need long battery life. You know, I don't need the most powerful processor. I, I really don't. Uh, and that's you do fine. a word processor. Yeah, I'm, I mean, you're I, not you're I'm not going to play pad call, user. You're not going to start playing I'm first not person play shooters call on there. Of Duty on there. <laughs> you know what? I would actually I would like to just hook up an Xbox and watch you play and just record you playing. That would be hilarious. Like I would want to do that. Just, I've we never could, played. We can shoot it here in the living room. I have never played uh, an Xbox game. Never once. Never once. And I'm uh, proud of it. What is the last game you've ever, have you? Like, have I ever played a video game? No. No. I never have. Nothing. Nothing. Not even on your phone. No. I don't believe that. I don't. Uh, my, I played Cut the Rope once. <laughs> <laughs> Does that count as anything? <laughs> No. Okay. It does not count. <laughs> it's, it's actually a deduction if anything were to count. No Pac-Man? No. That's interesting. I just know not a gamer. I, I was for a long time and something happened. Like I You think don't play now? Nothing. Nothing? No, really? Like, I'll play like a stupid game on my phone. That's it? That's it. Like wow. I... You Paul know never hap- made you go Call of Duty? I can't, I can't play those first person shooters. Wow. Like I am mm-hmm. so bad. I'm so I've attempted to play it yeah. like I bought the, I bought it I've played it yeah um you know what I played I played Mario then I have a Nintendo Wii U yeah I have the new Mario game yeah. and I played it like it's it's nostalgia it's my childhood yeah. so like I'm like yeah. oh this is great it's like I'm four <laughs> again and, but this time I'm able to drink and play you know <laughs> now it's better so my wife has come home like I actually have it in my bedroom like she's come home and like it's you know she went out with her friends it's like midnight and I'm playing Nintendo loaded <laughs> but I'm still playing Nintendo um uh, I can't <laughs> I can't dedicate the time. Yeah. I feel like I'm wasting time yeah. by playing it. Yeah. And then I, I like do it and it's like it's like cheating on my job. Like yeah. I then I like I'm, yeah. I feel guilty that right. I didn't play that it didn't work and I played eight hours. You don't want to confess that. what what changed <laughs> me was I was playing World of Warcraft mm-hmm. and I spent twelve hours playing oh, straight. What? <laughs> and I uninstalled it from my computer and then never played a game wow. again like that. Wow. Like I can't. It's, You're like I don't want to get addicted, mm-hmm. right? It, you know, it's it's just such a waste. Yeah. Like I don't have self control. Like I know that about yeah, me. Yeah, I think I'm that way too. So like I'm gonna start playing it and I'm gonna want to beat it. Right. 
And you're going to keep it. And I'm going to keep playing it. And yeah. it's like four days later, I haven't cha- I haven't showered or changed. And I'm just staring at this screen. Yeah. Uh, so I had to I have to stop it. I, I can and that see was it. that. That was it. That. Yeah. Talking about not stopping. I don't want to stop drinking. Okay. And we're going to go for a drink now. Yes, we are. Uh, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, Mary Jo Foley on Twitter. Mary Jo Foley? Yep. MJ at, Foley? At Mary Jo Foley. At Mary Jo Foley. I tweeted totally. I have no <laughs> idea who I just tweeted. I, it was some guy who was probably like, wow, who are all these people? I think I tweeted tweeting? some guy named Mick Foley. <laughs> I think so. Uh, that's who I tweeted. Uh, you can follow me at Andrew Zarian. We're going to go for a drink. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, that was MJ. fun. We Thanks have to for do inviting it again. me. Next, yeah. next time when Paul's away, all right. you have to come in again. Okay. And then we'll, we'll you know, have a do the same thing again. Sounds good. We'll talk about the same subjects too. Over I'll interview and over you. and over. That, that's all we're going to okay, do. Okay, awesome. This is it, guys. This is all you're getting from us. <laughs> we'll see you all next week on What the Tech. Good night, everybody.